All right, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to Sharks and Rays 101. My name is Zipsita and I am a public programs intern for UGA Marine Extension and Georgia Sea Grant. We conduct research, education, and outreach for healthy coastal ecosystems and communities. Wonderful, thank you Ipsita for getting us started. Uh, my name is Kayla Clark and I coordinate the public programs here. And we could spend an entire week just talking about all the different shark species and their conservation and their cool adaptations around the world. Uh, we only have an hour though. So our game plan is that we are going to talk really briefly about what a shark and a ray are, um, what, what kind of animal they are. Um, and then we're gonna dive in more specifically into a few species that you might find here in coastal Georgia. Um, including introducing you to a few of our aquarium ambassadors, um, some of our live animals and elasma branks here. Uh, then I'd like to share a little bit more information and resources about how to interact with these animals while you're recreationally fishing. Um, so if you are enjoying our coastal waters this summer, you have some information to make informed choices while interacting with these animals. Um, and then we'll think a little bit more about how research plays into conservation um, and how it can help provide the information that we need to inform management and conservation of elasma ranks, um, which are sharks and rays. Um, so at that point, we'll turn it over to Devin Dumont, who is the aquarium curator here um, and also studied shark nurseries for his masters. But before we dive in, I do have a question for all of you, which is, are sharks, rays, and skates all fish? So we'll go ahead and we'll launch that poll. Your answer is yes or no. Are sharks, rays, and skates all fishes? And so we'll go ahead and we'll stop the poll and share results. Awesome, so it seems like a mix of answers, but a number of people, 60% thought that the answer was yes. Um, and you are absolutely correct. So all of those animals, um, all of those animals are types of fish because they have gills, they've got fins, they've got backbones, um, and they live in water. So those are all characteristics of fish, which you can see on our next slide, um, show some examples of different types of fish. All the ones on the, this slide are actually bony fishes. Um, so that what that means is if you like feel your knuckles, feel your knees, all that hard part in our bodies, those are bones. Our skeletons are made of bones. So are bony fishes. Um, whereas if we switch to the next slide, something that's pretty different about sharks, rays, and skates are that they are cartilaginous fishes, um, which means that their skeletons are made of cartilage. So if you want, you can like wriggle your nose, tug on your ear. Those are both parts of our body where we have cartilage. So it's a similar structure that's supporting their body. So because they have that similarity and because they all have five or more gill slits visible, those are two of the reasons that we group all of these fish together. So sharks, rays, and skates are all called elasmobranchs as one big group. And globally, there's approximately a thousand species of these animals. Um, and unfortunately, a quarter of all of those known species are in danger of going extinct. Um, and so those are some of the similarities between them. But looking at these two pictures, what do you think might be some differences between sharks compared to rays and skates? And you can put your answers in the chat box at this time. And I'll give you a hint. If you look at those two pictures, that'll give you at least a few um, differences. Ipsita, did we have any responses? Yeah, so one person said the position of the gill slits, and then another person noticed how the fins were different. Yes, those are both great observations. So sharks, typically, their gills are going to be on the side of their body, whereas rays and skates, the gills are going to be located on the bottom of their body. Um, and because the rays and skates have their gills on the bottom, they have a special structure called a spiracle, which basically acts like a little snorkel, pulls water down from above and over their gills. Um, in rays and skates, their fins are oftentimes modified. You can see in this Atlantic stingray picture um, that it's shaped more like a disc uh, and they swim in a different way because of that. Um, and you can also see that the rays and skates are depressiform, meaning that their shape is a little bit like a pancake. So they're well adapted, they're flat, uh, well adapted to be living in that bottom habitat. Um, so we're going to start off, our first live animal we're going to meet is a ray. So we've got a true and false question for you or statement about rays. This is one that we get asked a lot. Um, is it true or false that all rays have a venomous stinger or barb? So you can go ahead. Um, and while you're doing, while you're answering the poll, I'm going to go ahead and get us ready 
to meet a live Atlantic stingray. So as soon as most folks have answered, we'll go ahead and uh, stop the poll and share the results so we can see what everyone thought. Awesome, so 16% uh, thought it was true and 84% thought it was false. Those of you that said false are absolutely correct. Um, so some do have um, a venomous barb, such as the Atlantic stingray, um, which is in our tank here. Um, but there are lots of other species, including here in Georgia, the butterfly ray, that don't have a barb. Um, and it's important to note that, at least here in the southeastern United States, um, while those barbs might be painful, they're not usually life-threatening. Um, and it's really just a defense mechanism for the animal. So the best way to avoid getting stung is just not to step on the animals. Um, so if you're swimming at our beaches, it's always good to do the stingray shuffle, where you basically just slide your feet along the sand as you're entering and exiting the water. Um, and the, the rays are gonna wanna get out of your way. They're gonna move away from you typically. So while we're looking at the Atlantic stingray here in the tank, <laughs> they are very active today. Um, so we'll try and keep up with them while they're swimming around. You can go ahead and you can type in the chat box any questions or observations about this animal that you might have. And you can tell that this tank is um, designed to mimic a habitat in a sound or an estuary. So they are in brackish water, which is a mix of salt and fresh. And you can really see as it comes towards us how it's using those modified fins um, to undulate as they're, as they're swimming, which is a little different than how uh, sharks swim by moving their tail back and forth. Oh, and right there behind the eye, do you see that uh, dark circle? That's the spiracle. So that's where they're pumping water in. Um, and we might, as it swims back, be able to get a, a view of its underside. We did have a question. Um, how old are they when they get their stingers? Oh, that is a great question. Um, they reach maturity after a couple of years, but um, Devin, do you have anything more to add on that? And if not, that's a great question. We can, we can look that up and get back to you. We usually send a follow-up email um, with any unanswered questions after the program as well. Any other questions or observations? Hey, Kayla, can you hear me? We can. Excellent. Sorry, I just wanted to say that they're usually born with a stinger already forming in place. Very cool. And you can actually, they're moving pretty fast today, um, but when it comes back around, the stinger is actually part way up the tail, so it's not at the very end. Um, oh, cool. We'll come back to the stinger, but right now we've got an underside shot. Did you all see the mouth there on the bottom? So they are gonna be bottom feeders, which is why their mouth is located under on the ventral side or the bottom side of their body. And right behind the eye, that's where the, that spiracle was. We had another question as to whether the camera was in the water. That is a great question. It is not. Um, the camera is on my cell phone that I am moving around on the outside of the tank. We have in the past occasionally put a GoPro into the tank as well. Well, if there are any questions on our Atlantic stingray, we're gonna transition over to our guitar fish. Um, so this is a really neat animal. What are some things as you're looking at it that might be similar or different to the Atlantic stingrays that we just observed? You can type your answers in the chat box. So there are um, many different uh, species of guitar fish. This one is an Atlantic guitar fish. Um, they swim typically with their, their nose a little bit higher than their tail. 
And do you all notice how it's swimming with its tail, its back, its back end? More similar to a shark than, for instance, the Atlantic stingray. Were there any other similarity, similarities or differences that people had noticed? Yeah, we had a bunch come in. So um, some people noticed how they had more fins or how the tail was longer and a bit fatter. Um, one person noticed that it had the head like a ray, but the body of the shark. And um, a similarity between them were the flattened shape and the gills. Yes, yeah, so those are all fantastic observations and all things that I was going to mention. So I'm really glad that you all observed them. Um, so you can see that the head region is more flattened, similar to a ray, but the back region is more similar to a shark. So they're kind of a neat linkage uh, between sharks and, and rays. And um, Devin, did you have anything else to add about this specific guitar fish? Uh, sure, I just wanted to say that uh, this individual is an adult female. She's uh, right about the maximum size for Atlantic guitar fish. And she's been with us for over a year now. Um, we initially caught her in a trawl on our RV Sea Dog. Very cool. And if anyone wants to see more about what we do for trawling, we are doing a program, not next Tuesday, but the following Tuesday on our trawling. Um, trawling vessel. Any questions from the audience about this animal? We did have one question. Um, where is the stinger? Oh, it's a great question. So um, the guitar fish doesn't actually have a barb the way that an Atlantic stingray does. So they have no venomous barb. They do have four thorny projections along the back of the tail, which if you were to step directly on that, it might hurt similar to if you were to step, you know, on the sharp edge of a shell. Um, or if you were to pick up and squeeze in that area, but it, it's not going to have a venomous barb. Great questions. Any other ones before we move on to our skates? We did not have any other questions currently. Awesome. So in that case, um, if she is going to pull back up our PowerPoint and share one more uh, true and false with you as I transition uh, into our uh, behind the scenes area. So I am curious what you all think. Is it true or false that all elasmobranch species lay eggs? True or false? And remember that elasmobranchs include the sharks, skates, and rays. So we are heading back to the behind the scenes area now. Um, so we're gonna be heading back. Um, and I think we can close the poll and go ahead and share um, the results. Oh, wow. So it looks like this was a much more mixed one. So it looks like 47% said true and 53% said false. Um, so this is a really tricky one. Um, they really have a pretty wide variety of reproductive strategies. Um, so some like the clear nose skate that you're gonna meet do lay eggs, but there are many species that give live birth um, or all kinds of interesting strategies as well. Um, so we're going to show you a video from Assistant cu Aquarium Curator, Lisa Kovalanchik. Um, so this is a, where you're going to see in just, just a moment behind the scenes, but she's going to explain what it is that you're seeing in this video. Um, my name is Lisa Kovalanchik. I am the Assistant Curator here at the UGA Aquarium. So I work to take care of all the animals that are here under our care, um, including husbandry, um, cleaning, feeding, all that sort of stuff. So um, what I'm going to show you here is some of our baby skates that we have in the aquarium. So a clear nose skate is a little bit different from a stingray. They have the same basic body shape, um, but some notable differences. Um, but they are a flat fish that lives on the bottom. And we have a breeding pair here at the aquarium. So they have produced all of these little babies. Um, what you'll see in the tank here is a number of egg cases. And so if you're on the beach, you might find some egg cases that look like this. Um, sometimes people call them mermaids purses, and they actually each house one little baby inside. Um, this is one that just hatched, so this is one of our newest baby skates. You're looking at the bottom here, so you can see its little mouth moving, its gills, its tail there, and its double lobed fins on the back. So each of those egg cases has one little baby inside, 
And then in the tank back here, you'll see some of the other little babies that we have. Um, so they've laid a number of, of eggs and had quite a few babies and they've all done really well here in our aquarium. Wonderful, thank you Epsita for playing that video. Um, so I wanted to share that so that you could hear from Lisa uh, directly. But then I also wanted to show you um, some of the ones that we currently have. So that was shot a few weeks ago. Um, right now we've got two egg cases that are back here. Um, oh wow, did you all just see it move? So it's a little bright, but we've got a flashlight behind these egg cases that you can see what's happening on the inside. Um, you can type in the chat box if you're making any observations. Maybe anything that you see is similar or different between the one on the left and the one on the right. If Sita, did we have any observations? Yeah, so one person noticed that the tail was moving on the right, but there's not as much movement on the left. Yes, that is fascinating. So what's happening here is that the one that's moving is further along in development. So you can actually start to see, if you look really closely, most of the shape of that baby skate. I and mean, you can actually see its tail moving back and forth. Whereas in the other one, what you're observing is just the egg yolk. So it hasn't um, quite developed to the point that the other one has. Very cool. I could watch them all day, but I do want to show you what they look like once they hatch out. So in this tank back here, as Lisa said, are some of the babies. But wanted to give you a nice close-up view of the, the young skates once they hatch out. So you can really see the gills well from this angle. That's how they're breathing. And you can see its mouth right there in the middle. Any questions about these ones? Yeah, so we had a question asking how long the baby skates will take to hatch. So that is a great question. So I'm going to let Devin weigh in on, on this one in terms of the development. And sure. The, the little babies will actually incubate or grow inside the egg cases for about 10 to 12 weeks before they hatch and swim out as fully formed miniature skates. We had another question as to, are the legs or the gills on the bottom? Are the, were they asking if the gills are on the bottom? Yeah, are the legs or the gills on the bottom? So right here, those are the gills. So you can actually see that pumping action is the animal breathing right now. Um, and they don't have any legs, but they do have these really interesting fins towards the back there that do move quite a bit. <laughs> that part that's wiggling back and forth, those are their lobed fins. What would be sort of the pelvic fin on a, a fish that might be a more traditional fish shape that you think of a fish as. Whereas the wings are more like their pectoral fins. So I want to show you some that are a little bit bigger so we can move um, to our quarantine tank. So these are tanks where animals um, can stay until they're on exhibit. And so you can see these ones are slightly bigger, but we do have quite a lot of skate babies. Um, they've been laying them for a while, every you know four days or so, always two at a time. So they are, if we think about life history, the skates do produce a lot more offspring than some elasmobranch species. <laughs> This one right at the surface is curious. And then even slightly larger, but still juvenile skates in this tank as well. Any other questions, observations? Yeah, we had one person ask, what are the predators for these skates? Yes, that is a great question. So larger fish are an example. Um, especially when they're, when they're smaller. And we had another question as to why do they come out on top to stick out a bit? That is a great question. Um, it may be that they are curious about food because today is a feeding day and they do get fed from the top of the tank. 
Um, but I don't know if that behavior signals anything else. Devin, anything that you would want to add on that behavior? Um, no, it's, it is an interesting behavior and in they are kind of just curious and learning their surroundings. Um, so they're sort of investigating just sort of the boundaries of the, the tank itself. And you know, these are animals that are swimming along the bottom. So you can see even when they're swimming up, a lot of them are swimming along the side of the tank, which probably feels similar to swimming, swimming along the bottom as well. Um, very cool. Well, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna look at one more thing here before we head back out to the front of the aquarium. Um, Cause Devin reminded me that we may be able to see in the 55 gallon tank over here, some of the claspers so on this particular skate, oh, now it's going away from us. This is how you can tell if it's a male or a female. So when it swims back, what you're looking for are kind of two oval-shaped projections in between those pelvic fins. We'll give it one more chance to swim by before we head back out just for timing. But while we're waiting, um, I can take any other questions that people have. Okay, so look, look quick and right there. <laughs> I know that was speedy, but did people see the claspers? Well, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna see um, the adult skate that laid these eggs. Um, and while we're doing that, Epita has another poll for you. And um, this one is, again, kind of a general one about Alaska, right? So is it true or false that the largest fish in the world living today is a shark? True or false in the whole world? So once you've answered, we can um, share the poll results. Okay, so about half and half. 53% thought it was true and 47% thought it was false. So believe it or not, it is true. And bonus question, if anyone can add in the chat box what species that is. So the largest fish in the world is a shark. And can you let me know what species it is? Yeah, we have a bunch of people saying it's a whale shark. Yes, absolutely. And they are just really interesting animals. Um, they can grow to be 40 feet long, um, and they're, so they're, they're massive, but they filter feed. So they're eating plankton, microscopic uh, plants and animals floating in the water. Um, I was really lucky last summer to go to Vermilion Sea Institute's field station where they do citizen science and education on whale sharks. Um, so if anyone is really jazzed about whale sharks, there are opportunities to plug into either uh, taking photographs of these animals or analyzing the photographs afterwards. And they actually, each uh, whale shark has its own unique spot pattern. And if you, um, if you get the pictures of them, you can stick it into a software that's the same that they use to map the stars in a galaxy. And based on that, they can map out where the spots are and tell which individual whale shark it is. But I could go on a tangent all day about whale sharks, one of my favorite animals, but we're gonna, we're back in front of the Clearness Skate exhibit. So I do wanna show you what the adult looks like. So those egg cases that we saw and the um, baby skates, this is their mom. Any questions about her? Or anything that you would like to add, Devin? Sure, just that she has laid over 40 um, the egg cases are, and you know it's always fun to watch the little babies grow. Yeah it's been a, a real treat having them here. Um, okay well in that case we're going to transition back to share some information about um, now that you've seen some of these live animals um, kind of some information about if you encounter them in the wild while you're enjoying our coastal waters. Um, so while Epsida is sharing the PowerPoint um, about how much time do we have left? We have about four minutes left until Devin goes live. 
Okay, so this will be pretty, pretty quick on the info. Um, but if you go to our web posting where you signed up for this class, um, we do have an activity sheet called Shark Study. And at the bottom of it um, is some additional resources to find out more. Um, so I did want to mention you saw the clear nose skate and you saw the Atlantic stingray. Um, but two other common species that you might encounter if you're out fishing um, in coastal Georgia in shore are the Atlantic sharp nose shark and the bonnethead. So those are two photos of them. Um, and we can move on to the next slide to see some examples of if you do encounter any of these four animals, um, what you can do to help protect them is, you know, if you're recreationally fishing, uh, make sure you have a fishing license. Not only is it required by law, but the funds from that actually go to um, uh, go to funding fish conservation and uh, fish habitat. And you'll also need a saltwater information permit if you're fishing in Georgia saltwater. It's free, but it just lets them know how many of out of all of the fishing license, how many people are actually fishing in saltwater. Um, make sure you're following the regulations. They're there to protect the populations of species um, so that we can take some, but then also still have plenty left um, to reproduce and create more. Um, part, of, part of the regulations have to do with which shark and ray species you can keep and which ones you have to release. So it's important to practice your shark and ray ID. Um, and the link that's there on that slide, we'll put that um, in the chat box as well. Um, so you can download those regulations there. Um, and they also have a really great resource that shows some of the common sharks that you might catch and some examples of how you might measure them. Um, Devin will talk more about tagging sharks. And so if you do ever catch a shark that has a tag on it, there, is, there are places where you can report that and it helps us understand better about, about these animals. Um, and then if you are catch and release, it's always good to use best practices. Um, so we'll just speed through these. But um, a big one is to use a non-offset circle hooks. So that's the one that looks like a circle there on the left-hand side. Next to it is a J hook. So the circle hook is designed to catch the edge of the fish's mouth as opposed to getting swallowed. So it helps prevent um, gut hooking of the animals. And so then if we move on to the next one, if you do catch it, just make sure that if you're bringing it on board, that you're holding it horizontally with wet hands, you're minimizing the handling. These are both pictures from our coastal stewards workshop on recreational fishing. Um, so once we start to have on-site programs again, I encourage you to check out that um, series if you're an adult and interested in learning some more of these skills. And we also do family fishing as well. Um, so I think on our next slide, it'll show us. Um, oh, so I do want to say that if you're, if you're fishing in summer in Georgia and you're bottom fishing, maybe for something like whiting, you probably should be prepared um, to catch some Atlantic stingray because they're in that same habitat. So we're going to play this video quickly. Um, this is one of the boat captains, Todd car showing how he handles the stingrays that we catch in our trawl net. So you can see that he's controlling the back end of the tail there because the barb is halfway up on the tail. Um, if you're not comfortable doing that, um, you could dehook it while it's still over the water. Just be aware that they are really flexible with that tail. Um, but there's no need to cut off the animal's tail because then it can't grow it back. I and mean, that can really impact its ability to defend itself. Um, and if you're not comfortable doing the method that Todd just showed on the next slide, this is from a family fishing program. You can see that one of the educators is using a not less rubber net and so able to handle it from a distance. Um, and you can see that folks are taking a picture of their catch, but they had their camera ready so that that way they could get the picture quick, get the animal back in the water to again, minimize that handling time. Um, and so then on our next slide are some examples of habitats where these elasmobranchs are living. So oftentimes we think about fishing and, and what to do either commercially or recreationally to conserve sharks and rays, um, but it's equally as important to protect the habitats that they're living in. So here in Georgia, that includes making sure that we have healthy estuaries, salt marshes, um, and healthy live bottom reefs offshore at places like Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary, which you can see a nurse shark in the reef there. Um, but in order to prioritize which places are most important, um, Research is necessary to gather that information about, about the sharks and about the rays and where they're using. So our next slide shows some examples of research. Um, I don't know that we have time to click on the shark tracker, but I just want to mention that that is a super cool resource. Um, 
and we include it in the activity sheet. You can go on there and actually see where sharks tagged in Georgia have traveled. Um, it's all around the world. Um, you can actually, it's in real time and the, the tracker on the animal, whenever it comes up to the surface, pings a satellite. Um, so it's interesting even to check again and again to see updates. Um, in addition to satellite tags, uh, researchers can study sharks doing catch and release studies using things like gill nets or long lines. Um, so we are in luck today to talk to someone who's done that sort of research. So Devin Dumont is the aquarium curator here, um, but he also studied shark nurseries uh, with Savannah State University for his master's. So we're giving you a sneak peek of the O-Search shark tracker, and then we're gonna turn it over to Devin when he's ready to share his PowerPoint screen. All right, well, thank you, Kayla. And thank you to everyone joining us today. I'm very excited to be able to speak with you today about the research I conducted uh, with the Georgia Department of Natural Resources for my master's thesis at Savannah State University. Um, as Kayla kind of mentioned, you know, sharks as are apex predators and they're critical for maintaining ecosystem a balance and healthy oceans. So it's important to monitor shark populations and identify essential habitats for the protection and conservation of sharks. Also, sharks are important to people who fish for them both recreationally and commercially. So one method or gear type used to catch sharks for population surveys is called a long line. Um, so this is, uh, you can see this is a bottom set long line where basically there are a number of hooks, baited hooks between two anchors and there's also a rope line that goes to the surface with a buoy on it. When we, we sampled both inshore and offshore locations of the Georgia coast from um, Doughboy Sound near Sapelo Island all the way south to the Florida Georgia border. When we set our long lines, we only set them in the water for about 30 minutes and then reel them back in to see what sort of numbers and diversity we caught. Uh, pictured here is the RV Marguerite. It's a DNR vessel that was used to de deploy and retrieve the offshore long line. And we used a hydraulic winch in order to do that. The inshore long line was deployed and retrieved by hand. So um, you can imagine during the summer months, reeling in a thousand foot long line by hand got pretty hot and sweaty. And then on top of that, there was the excitement of actually catching sharks. So when we, got, when we caught the sharks, we'd you know, try to get them in, on board and de-hooked. Um, you can see here, this is a, a bonnet head shark, an adult female bonnet head shark that we caught. And once we have them on board, we start the process of getting information from that every single animal. So you can see the kind of information that we're trying to get from every single animal um, includes the species, the gender. Um, as Kayla mentioned earlier, if the sharks have claspers, we know for a fact that they are male. Um, but we'll also you know, get some total, some length measurements, some weight measurements, and then we'll identify the life stage of every single shark. So that means we're looking to determine whether it's a neonate, and a neonate really is a term for a newborn shark. Um, and so we distinguish between neonates and juveniles based on their umbilical scar. Um, we can also distinguish between juveniles and adults um, based on the clasper calcification or clasper length. And um, we also use some literature research to determine juveniles from adults. Um, that happened later on. on. 
on the boat, all of this had to happen very quickly. And so after getting the information we needed, we tagged the sharks with a roto tag or dart tag and then release them back into the water in good condition. So all of this really happened in under one minute in order to get the, the shark back in the water safely and in good condition. Um, this is a sort of a diagram to show you the umbilical scar. So basically the newborns and juveniles will have a belly button, essentially. It looks like a belly button and it's where their umbilical cord was attached to um, a placenta inside their mother. But um, you can see there are cert certain uh, stages, the first one being open without remains, the second partially healed, then down from there is well healed. You can see that the opening is closing until finally the umbilical scar is not present anymore. So we categorize sharks with um, the first two stages as neonates and the last two as juveniles. Um, so like I said, we needed to get as much information from every single shark as possible. You can see us uh, just sort of weighing the sharks after we got the hooks out. I mean, excuse me, measuring the sharks after we got the hook out. We measured to both the total fork length and total length. So um, sort of the notch in the tail or caudal fin of the shark is what we measured as the fork length. And then total length is that stretched out overall. And see me here weighing a neonate Atlantic sharp nose shark. Um, we encountered quite a few of them. And then the tag, which was a roto tag for this individual or these two individuals and basically goes at the base of the dorsal fin. And that tag has a coded ID number that's specific to that animal. Um, and it has the information or telephone number that um, people can call to report catching that shark again, um, as Kayla mentioned earlier. So that surveys like that where we have there, there's cooperation from the community are very helpful for understanding habitat use for sharks. And when I say that, I mean the area that it's using, but also the time of the year where those sharks might be using estuaries as nursery habitats. Um, sorry, this, I just wanted to include this cute little picture of a neonate scallop hammerhead. It was adorable. Um, so this table shows uh, the diversity and relative abundance of um, all of the sharks we caught between inshore and offshore waters. Um, so just within two years, we caught well over 3,000 sharks, but the most abundant species were the Atlantic sharp nose shark, bonnethead shark, sandbar shark, black tip shark, and black nose shark. This map shows a nursery assessment um, for the Atlantic sharp nose shark. And if you look at the key in the bottom right, you can see that the red triangles represent neonates, green X's represent juveniles, and the blue dots represents the adults. So we can see that really all life, all life stages for the Atlantic sharp nose sharks were mixed uh, between inshore and offshore waters. We also did some statistical analyses to determine that this species um, might not, may or may not use Georgia estuaries as a nursery habitat. Um, there was sort of wasn't definitive evidence to prove that it used the estuaries as a nursery habitat. So we're still doing more research today to, to try to determine that. Um, this map shows the distribution of life stages for the bonnet head shark. Um, something you may notice is that there are no red triangles. Uh, during this entire survey, we did not catch any neonate bonnet heads. Um, we caught plenty of juveniles and many adults. So we think that the neonates 
or neonate bonnet heads utilize sort of a micro habitat within the Georgia estuary system that we just couldn't sample or survey um, due to our boat size or uh, gear length. Um, so they might be using like much smaller tidal creeks and shallower waters for those uh, initial weeks and months before they move out into deeper water and bigger water. This map shows the distribution of the sandbar sharks that we caught. And you can see definitively that all of these, all of the neonates were caught within intro waters. Um, there were many juveniles caught within the inshore area as well. There were a few juveniles that were caught offshore. Um, however, we, when we go back to look at the timing of that, um, those juveniles that are caught offshore were caught during the September and October months when the sandbar sharks migrate out of the estuaries um, for their overwintering habitat off the coast of North Carolina. So I've got one more map that I'd like to show y'all, or two maps, and ask the audience a question. Um, if you look at these two maps, you can see the black tip distribution on the left and the black nose distribution on the right. Uh, my question is, does anyone notice similarities or differences between the life stage distribution? I'll give you all a second to kind of take a look. Um, and then if, if, please type your responses in the chat box and Epsita will read them out to us. Yeah, so one person noticed the clustering of adults for the black nose shark. And then another person noticed that both have similar juveniles, but um, the black nose generally has a lot more adults. Those are both great observations. Good job. Um, those are great observations. So, so let me ask this. Does anyone notice where the black nose sharks were caught versus where the black tip sharks were caught. Take, take one more second to type um, some responses and then we'll talk about the answer. One person noticed that the black nose were caught more offshore, offshore compared to the black tip. <laughs> Excellent, good job. That's exactly right. The, the vast majority of black nose sharks were all caught offshore. There were only a few adults that were caught inshore, and which is very interesting because this species was the second most abundant species um, in the survey. Um, so that lets us, so we're looking at this map and you know, lets us determine that the black nose shark does not use Georgia estuaries as nursery habitats. Um, and they barely use Georgia estuaries as, you know, habitats at all. Um, they're probably moving into parts of the sound for feeding, but then stay off the beaches and offshore. So good job, you guys, for, for noticing that. And so uh, there is ongoing research today. Um, you know, like I said, this was just for my master's thesis, but there are a number of um, agencies and organizations that are doing continuous shark research, um, especially looking at shark nursery habitats and trying to identify those all up and down the East Coast. Uh, and we're going to include some links to, uh, you know, some of those resources uh, um, at the end here. But right now, I'd like to uh, answer any questions that y'all might have about the shark research I did. Yeah, so we had a number of questions come in. Um, one person is wondering, are there elderly sharks? Elderly sharks? Um, sharks are very long lived animals in general. And um, I think if the question is maybe they are, if they, if their bodies 
wear down over time as they get older, which is certainly possible. But in, they are very healthy animals. Um, they're sort of known for being um, having very strong immune systems. And some species can live a very, very, very long time. Um, so with this, the sharks that we caught, for instance, the sandbar shark, um, it doesn't become sexually mature or able to mate until it's um, almost 20 years old. Awesome. So one person was asking, what is the difference between the black tip and the black nose shark? That's a great question. Um, they are two different species. So the black nose, as it sounds, has sort of a, a, a black spot right on the tip of its nose. Um, it's the black nose is a smaller species or smaller compared to the black tip shark. Um, and the black tips refer to the pectoral fins um, uh, at the, on the very tip of their pectoral fins, um, usually their dorsal fin and then their caudal fin, there is a, a black mark, um, with, hence the name black tip. So those two species can't um, mate or, or produce offspring together. Yeah, so we have some people that are interested in participating in shark research um, or they want to go into the field. So how can someone who's interested um, get into that? That's a great question. Um, I would say just, you know, always pursue your passions and, um, you know, for, for myself, I, I went into the master's program at Savannah State University wanting to study sharks. Um, and I was fortunate to be able to connect with uh, researchers at the Georgia Department of Natural Resources Coastal Research Division. Um, but there are there are many other uh, places that offer, you know, sort of snapshots of uh, shark research. Um, there are internships that people can apply for just to get them. Uh, you know, or get, get their foot in the water per se, um, and to get, to practice using different gear types for catching sharks. Um, like I said, I, I use long lines for my research, but there are gill nets that can be used, um, hook and line sample surveys. Uh, there, so there, there are many ways that it's, I just encourage people to always stay interested and pursue your, your passions. That's awesome. Um, one person is asking, where are the umbilical scars on the sharks? Oh, great question. I'm sorry, I didn't say that. It's, it's basically on, the, on their belly. So if you were to roll the shark over about two thirds of the way down, there's basically that, that umbilical scar, like a belly button. Yeah, and if anyone is interested in learning more about um, shark studies or how Devin and other researchers um, do their studies. We do have an activity sheet on the site you registered, so you can go check that out. Um, so we had a question on, have you ever caught a great white or a bull shark? That's a good, great question. Um, I've never caught a great white shark. Our sampling occurred from April, until October on the Georgia coast. So during those months, um, great white sharks are not typically found off the Georgia coast, but they do frequent waters um, or pass through Georgia waters in the winter months. Um, we did catch two bull sharks in my sampling survey. Again, you know, we caught over 3,000 sharks, but we did only caught two bull sharks. Um, However, one of them was on the hand long line. So as I was trying to reel the line in by hand, all of a sudden a six foot bull shark decided to try to swim away and almost pulled me into the water. Um, it, was, it was, we laughed about it later, but um, we, we still were able to get, I was able to pull the line all the way up to the surface. 
so that we could still see the shark, identify the species, and, and get an estimate for the total length. Well, I'm glad you're still okay. <laughs> Thanks. It was fun. What is your favorite shark? Ooh, that's a tricky one. Um, I think my favorite shark might be the bonnet head. It's um, the smallest species of hammerhead shark and it was very common in Georgia waters. So we encountered it quite a bit. And um, I just I just think they're, they're really cool. Um, a lot of them had sort of sun spots or freckles on their backs, uh, which I thought was really interesting. Um, so if, if I had to pick one right now, that would be it. If you ask me tomorrow, it might be another one. Um, so going back to the skates, um, there were a couple people interested in the black skate and wondering, is it a different species um, or is it just a different coloration? It's a great question. Uh, it's the same species. Technically, I would think that you could say all of those little babies are siblings since they came from the same parents. Um, but they just do have some minor um, differences in, in coloration and patterns on their back, um, you know, similar to how some of us might have blonde hair or brown hair. Um, we have some people wondering how many sharks are in the ocean? <laughs> Well, I can't, I don't know if I can answer that accurately, but I can say that um, millions of sharks are caught every year by people fishing for them. Um, a lot of them are going to uh, seafood markets. Um, so that's, you know, it's important to try to get an idea of how many sharks there are um, and or seasonally. So if, for instance, my research for two years, we could say that we caught this number of sharks or, um, you know, X number of Atlantic sharp nose sharks. And so if we do the same survey years later and, and find that we're catching fewer sharks of that species or fewer sharks of all species or maybe the size of those sharks that we're catching is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, then that's how uh, resource managers make decisions to sort of uh, limit how many sharks people can catch or keep um, on any given day. Um, we, we did have a question on how far inland do sharks swim up um, and whether you caught any in a stream or a marsh. Um, those more more good questions. I love questions, but um, there are, there's one species of shark that we have have on the Georgia, Georgia coast uh, that can swim into fresh water, the bull shark, um, and it has sort of the record for um, the farthest length. Um, a, a freshwater body source. Um, I'm sorry, I can't remember the year, but it, it was, it's a known fact that a man fishing in the Mississippi River caught a shark, a bull shark in uh, near St. Louis. Um, I guess that might be the Mississippi or Missouri River at that point. So that's, you know, almost a thousand miles inland. But um, bull sharks are unique because about being able to swim into fresh water because they can control the amount of salts that they have inside their body. And um, so if, if the, the second question was about catching sharks in a stream or a creek. Um, or marsh, yes. Or marsh. Uh, well, I have caught very small sharks um, just fishing for fun uh, in tidal creeks around uh, in barrier islands of Georgia coast. So, um, but they were all very small and again, would probably rather not have ever seen me. <laughs> we had a question. Is the Megalodon still alive today? The Megalodon oh, is not still alive today. 
that's what all the scientific community says. But it is possible to find a megalodon tooth um, on the Georgia coast. Um, and talking about coasts, have you ever found a shark on the beach? I've, I've seen small, small sharks and rays swimming along the beach um, near the shore, uh, really on the beach side of Barrier Islands or wrapped around the north or south end of Barrier Islands, some um, sort of just cruising in shallow water looking for food. Um, but I'm, but th those were very remote places um, at the time. I've never seen one swimming along the beach at Tybee. Um, we had a question. Could you clarify what long lines are? Oh, sure. Um, so a, a long line, it's really just a, a piece or a rope or a very long monofil monofilament line, like similar to a very thick fishing line um, that can be set on the seafloor with anchors, uh, like, like we did in our survey. Um, sometimes shark surveys can use floating long lines at the surface, just depending on what area they're trying to sample. So um, the our inshore long line was about a thousand feet long and it was just a, a piece of a one length of black rope that had 50 hooks kind of snapped onto it at, at different intervals. Um, the offshore long line was that thick mono, monofilament um, and it was more, it was closer to 3000 feet long and had 60 hooks kind of snapped on at intervals. Yeah, and so one last question. Um, what are you going to do with the baby clear nose skates at the aquarium? <laughs> oh, that's a great question. They are very cute. Um, they, we have quite a few of them. So we've actually given some away to other educational facilities here in the area. Um, we've released some back into the wild. And for the rest, we're just going to keep growing them and keep feeding them to get them bigger and bigger. Um, we may try to, you know, uh, you know, continue offering them to other aquariums in close proximity. Um, and we'll sort of just see what happens. Well, it looks like that's all the time we have today for questions. But if you have any unanswered questions, feel free to reach out. If you had fun today, then I hope you will consider joining us next Tuesday at 11 a.m. for Skull Puzzles. In addition, every Thursday at 2 p.m., we have a virtual series for families with children ages 4 to 8, with next week being all about crabs. I do want to give a big thank you at this time to any friends in the audience, as your donations and support help us offer educational programming this summer. And if anyone is interested in becoming a friend, the application is on our website. You can also stay connected with us after the program, by attending other public programs, following us on social media, or learning about our volunteer and internship opportunities. Thank you for joining us and see you next week.